Welcome to the Hunting News Podcast. I'm your host, Steven Ziegler, and I'm here with my co-host, Aaron Futrell. Since this is our first podcast on YouTube, uh, since we screwed up the first one, uh, Corey Rockich, who's our producer behind the screen. Hi, folks. <laughs> we, uh, we'll reintroduce ourselves. Uh, we've been hunting, fishing our whole lives. Um, we've been writing for the outdoor industry uh, for about 10 years now. Uh, we got our start when we started recording a bunch of rabbit hunting for YouTube. Our whole goal was to be famous rabbit hunting YouTubers, which turns out is not a real thing, but it was a lot of fun. I recorded my grandma shooting a deer at 80 years old with a crossbow, went viral. Ted Nugent, who we hope to have on this podcast at some time, Ted Nugent, uh, <laughs> big number one guest for me. Um, uh, he shared it. Kendall Jones, who's a just a hot blonde Texas just if you think hop on from Texas cheerleader, Texas tech cheerleader, that you know exactly what she looks like. She's in the hunting industry. She shared it. She's got a million followers. Mm-hmm. It went viral. Um, from there, we ended up, you found a raccoon in a tank. You threw it. You launched the ra- raccoon through the air, which was our first super viral video doing yep. 100 million total views between all the platforms. Yeah, and it's an army tank. It just wasn't like just a oil tank or anything like that. It was an army tank at uh, the National Guard facility that I worked at. So I grabbed this little guy who was stuck in the periscope hole, put him out and launched him off the tank. And if you Google raccoon stuck in army tank, it's the first thing that comes up and you will see it. And then it has 33, 34 million views on Facebook and has been all over the world. Um, it was on uh, the Weather Channel, the Daily Mail. Tokyo uh, News Network. Those yes. Japanese love their trash pandas. Oh, yeah. As they and call them. It was even on Russian news. So the Ruskies, they, I guess they like raccoons too. I guess so. They don't like much, but they liked you. <laughs> and vodka. So from there, yeah, yeah, raccoons and vodka. So from there, we, we, were, we were running the huntingnews.com. We were doing about one to two million people a month there. Um, our Facebook pages were reaching, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100 million. Um, they're still around there. So you see us a lot on Facebook. That's where we'll interact with people for the most part. So if you have a question or something you want us to talk about or an interesting topic, or you think that one of us said something dumb or you like what we said, yeah, comment probably, on there. probably you, it, it, you know, it, people tend to love or hate what I have to say. So that's cool. <laughs> um, but it'll be on there. Uh, we will interact with all those comments. Um, like I said, I've been writing. We purchased DeLong Lures a couple years ago, which was the literally the company who invented the rubber worm uh, was David DeLong in 1946, right down the road from here in Akron, Ohio. Um, so that is our sponsor for the podcast right now, just because we want to make something out of it. But we're kind of pushing away all the advertisers that have kind of reached out so far until we find something that we actually want to work with. So long term, we'll have somebody, but it'll be something that we actually use and like. Um, but from there, like I said, one to two million people were reading our content every month and me and you were doing all the writing. So, um, it grew from there. Uh, after that Facebook's algorithms didn't really, you know, they're always all over the place. So we bought the long lures and then now we have, you know, we still do the, the Facebook content on, on, with all of our pages, the hunting news, rack junkies, the sportsman party. Um, a lot of you guys will know us from there. Now you kind of put a face with the, the pages and then that is my my whole history of writing. Um, we've both written books. Um, we're both yeah. authors. Um, I, yeah. You wrote, go ahead and tell us about, Aaron, tell us about you, how you got here, about how you got your Purple Heart, <laughs> and then your books. And then I'll talk about my books afterwards. Yeah, we'll talk about your books. But anyways, yeah, I'm a um, Purple Heart combat veteran. I did uh, 20 years in the Army with a part of it, active duty, part of it, National Guard. And was medically retired after being injured in Iraq in 2020 when the Iranians decided to shoot ballistic missiles into Iraq and blew one up uh, within 100 meters of me, giving me a traumatic brain injury. So if I'm a little bit slow, that's the reason why. So he usually picks on me a little bit for having brain damage, but it's all in good fun. So yeah. there's that. So yeah, anyway, some of us were born that way. Others of us, were, you know, you know, blown up to get that way. So yeah, like you know. He was idiot by birth. I was idiot by, you know, massive, combat. Massive explosion. <laughs> so you wrote, you've written four books? Yeah, four books. Uh, so I read, that wrote the uh, Deer Stand Devotional and Following His Tracks, which are two hunting-related Christian devotionals. Then I also wrote uh, Why We Hunt, which is more of a hunting philosophy book. And then I also wrote an Ohio history book, which my degree is in history from the University of Akron. Yeah. So I decided to add... A little bit of that to my, uh, you know, catalog of books. Yeah, and for for me, I'm I, I write more philosophy. Um, the the yeah. first book being uh, 
a complete guide to constitutional gun control. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second one was a deep look into the mind of Joe Biden. Um, I've been called a modern day philosopher after writing those. It's kind of a shocking title for me to hear, but um, those books are, they, they called me that they, who's they, that's they, um, (laughs) they are both blank books. So if you're wondering, yes, I wrote books with no words, no, no pictures, no nothing. It's just blank books. So if you are a fan of Joe Biden, you probably won't like that book. Um, However, it is very accurate. So if you, if you have friends that are friends that like Joe Biden, it's a great gift yes, for him. Yes, it's on Amazon. It's a true story. You can get on Amazon and buy this book. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, so that's who we are. You're going to learn more about us in uh, hunting. Now, the first episode was about the biggest bucks and where to shoot the biggest bucks and that kind of stuff. That'll be on the podcast platforms. Uh, this is going to be the first one for YouTube. So we're actually going to be doing a lot of just stories. Like when we did the hunting news, we, we've written thousands of articles um, about hunting news, about um, like, just the, the I, I used to read every single bill that was passed for hunting, fishing, outdoors, public lands, gun bills, all that stuff. I would re- I would read them and then I would write them and then I'd call you and be like, hey, could you re-edit this because I want to make sure I, I sound like more professional. Said, Idiot by birth. Yeah, <laughs> <That's> exactly. <cool. laughs> but yeah, so the first, the first episode we're going to do here, we actually have a very interesting story. Um, out of Pennsylvania, we're going to talk about that. I think that if you are a hunter, you should really be paying attention to this because it could have big implications. I think that according to this, if it goes as far as it seems like it's going, I'm a poacher. I'm going to, based on what these, they're trying to charge these guys with. It seems like I've poached deer in my life based on that. And probably you have to, I would say probably a good chunk of us, you know, if they, if you follow the letter of the law, according to testimony, in these court in this court case, yes. but we'll get into that. But first, uh, I'll give you a little intro on the court case and uh, how it uh, unfolds. But it's it's kind of interesting when I read it. It's like uh, it's like whoa, this is bigger than what the court case was actually about, and like the testimony really brought things forward, and it really shows that a lot of Gabe agencies. I'm sure this one highlights Pennsylvania, but it's probably um, true all across the country that a lot of game. Um, enforcement agencies needs to clarify laws that may be sort of um, ambiguous. And there's some ambiguous language and some ambiguous um, uh, citations in this and the way they were enforcing these laws that really should give hunters some pause and be like, hey, this definitely needs to be clarified by the legislature and by judges so that we can actually hunt in a lawful manner so that we're, you know, doing things respectfully because, you know, when we go out and go hunting, that's what we want to do. We want to harvest the animal respectfully and lawfully and do what we're doing. But if the law is confusing or and we think we're doing the right thing, but it turns out we're not. But some of the things that everybody thinks they're doing that's right, according to like the testimony of these game wardens, you're probably not if you live in Pennsylvania. I would venture to say if everybody listening to this, I know when you get on social media and a poaching case comes up from one of these TV hunters, which we've reported on, like literally Chris Brackett, we broke the story on Chris Brackett, yeah. and he threatened to sue us multiple times. But to be fair to all those guys, I would venture to say, I think, I bet you 75% minimum people, guys who've hunted in harvested deer uh, on a regular basis at some point in their life have broken some law whether intentional or unintentional Mm -hmm. and i think that's something as much as i'm i'm the first guy to be like you know chris brackett i mean he shot two bucks um and i actually like the guy i've talked to him since then but you know there's 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 a lot of other ones that you know i I think pig man was one i know ted nugent got charged with something every i I guarantee you 75 percent of people have broken a law on purpose or on accident or Mm -hmm. something that was like well you know i so as much as we'll we'll talk about those cases, uh, be honest with yourself. Have you ever broken a law that was as minor as this? Um, this one on the court case. So go jump okay. jump into this court case. Okay, let's go. Okay, this is uh, out of Pennsylvania. Josh Wingroth was convicted of multiple vi- wildlife violation in Lancaster County District Court on Thursday for using a drone to help recover deer. Okay, and drone recovery is illegal in Pennsylvania, and he was running a drone deer recovery operation. That the part is not controversial. He broke the law there. He had a deer recovery uh, operation with a drone. And these game wardens had a sting operation going on where they hired him to recover a wounded deer. And he helped them. And then 
that's when they cited him for that. Uh, let me let me just say right there that I'm gonna say if you are using a drone to help recover deer, I don't have a problem. I think yeah. that should be legal. I really think um, that a lot of things where guys like game agencies will come out and make laws to try and get ahead of things. I think that's what they're doing here. Like, hey, hunting with with drones is going to be a real problem if we just let it go. So they're trying to set up these laws, and I, I think that they'll probably pull a lot of these back. Yeah, which is what is confusing about this case as that's to why they push so hard. That's what's actually happening in this one. The uh, there's actually legislature going through the pens. Laws are going through the Pennsylvania legislature right now to make drone um, deer recovery legal. Like at this oh, moment, to make it so they're trying to reverse this right now. They're trying to reverse okay. this right now. So okay. it's like so he's Good. but he did this while it was still on the books as being illegal, as using drones to aid in the recovery of wildlife. The recovery now, if you're using drones to hunt, I think we got to kind of stop that. Yeah, you know? but like, I mean, people use cell cams all the time too, and I mean. Well, when we think of drones to hunt, I think of when I was in Iraq. and that, But that's a whole, totally different type of hunting. I, I saw the videos. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so what, what, okay, but where's anyway, the case at now? Um, I'll go down there. But, you have, but like I said before, this case has bigger implications, not because of, what, of the drone. The drone part is small potatoes on this case. You know, ever heard of Mar, the case of Marbury versus Madison? Yes. So what what is Marbury of Madison? I don't know. I just heard about it. I've listened to enough podcasts. I've heard about it. (laughs) Yeah, that is the case which gave the Supreme Court judicial review in this country. That's where they can recall recall call a law unconstitutional. Yes, they're actually revisiting that in the courts right now. Yeah, but anyways, they it had nothing to do with the actual case. The case was I can't even. Nobody even knows what the case was actually about. But their ruling says we cannot rule on this case because this law is unconstitutional. So the case was actually thrown out of their court because it was unconstitutional. So the what the case is about is seems to be irrelevant by the things that actually took place in the court. And what we're going to look at here is the other convictions that he received and what the testimony from the wildlife officers said that means it's probably going to make most uh, a lot of hunters in Pennsylvania uh poachers either more than likely by accident or by happenstance so uh let's see here uh let me go find which is the ones uh because he plans on appealing i would hope so if you yeah. if, if, if if it's this if it's this yeah silly. because he was he was charged the biggest one was uh spotlighting wildlife when uh-huh. his light shined on a deer so and uh did the drone have a yeah it had a light on it at the time so um one count of disturbing game or wildlife and one count of violating regulations on recreational spotlighting so recreational spotlighting that's the the big one we're going to talk about and and also the definition of hunting in itself what constitutes hunting Okay, so with with the spotlight, stay on that for right now. The, the spotlighting is that that seems to me that if you're using, I think of spotlighting as people taking a truck out into the field spotlighting deer, or sitting in the back of a truck with a giant spotlight shining a spotlight on a deer spotlighting. But by this definition, it seems to me that you could like if you're just using a regular flashlight, because I mean the drone lights aren't that big. I mean, all this, right, here's the uh, here's what. I'm- um, the use prohibited by use of spotlight to search for or locate for any purpose any game or wildlife we're in within this commonwealth at any time during the antler deer rifle season and during the antlerless deer rifle season it is not immediately or like it's not immediately clear if it was to so it's like for any purpose if you're using a light to locate or search for wild game within the commonwealth so Based on this, it would be so. Is this this could put people people could get in trouble for using a flash? I mean, going to a stand. I mean, and you shine a deer inadvertently because the deer that he shined the light on was, according to the other parts of the car documents, wasn't the deer he was looking for. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, so he just was shining. He was, he, just looking, he, for he was looking for the deer and saw other deer, and the light went across them. So they called it for spotlighting because he was searching for this down deer. Now, I want to know if this did this guy like mouth off to these game wards or something because it seems like they're just out to get him. It this. does. So and also the um it goes over by the entire definition of hunting. So it's like here it's like um let me go back to this one um it's like 
according to his lawyer, they expected a verdict, a, a guilty verdict, mainly because of the drone. Um, but he says um, the larger issue, whether drones should be allowed to recover deer, was overshadowed by what they call bombshell testimony by the two game wardens that he says could have profound and draconian consequences for the hunting public. Um, the two game wardens that were involved in the sting of operations uh, that took place in Lancaster County. OK, there's a flew his drone over. OK, both the arresting officer and the under officer and both a game warden for over 30 years testified that it is illegal to recover down game at night without a weapon. This position is against all con- conventional understanding of the hunting public and the requirements under the game and wild code requiring a hunter to legally obligated to use all the best efforts to recover down game animals. So, so basically they're saying that using a spot, so using a flashlight to recover deer is no, illegal. No, this is not even, this is recovering down, down game at night. So you shoot a deer yeah, so if you shoot a deer, you can't recover it at night with a flashlight? After legal, so basically what they're saying is after legal hunting hours and you shoot a deer, you can't recover it. So uh, it, it, that that is because they are saying that that is part of hunting and that after legal hunting hours, that recovering your deer is part of hunting. Okay, so basically, yeah, so basically they're 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 out to get this guy for some reason. That's what it, it, it seems like. There's got to be something more to this case that we don't know about. Like they, this guy had it, to have mouthed off, or he had to have done something that should make him mad. That still that shouldn't matter. Oh well, it shouldn't matter. But we all know that it, it does. Listen, I remember being in a fight when I was a kid with a bunch of redneck kids with your brother and my brother, <laughs> and the one the cop showed up and the one kid ran away and the the kid goes, the cop looks at the kid and goes, hey uh. Where's your buddy? He's like, I'm not telling you. And he's like, well, then I, I'll get you for obstruction of justice. And he was like, I'll take one for the team. When we went to court, the judge literally, we, we all got we all got just some dumb charge for fighting. It was like 20 hours of community service and a $100 fight, something stupid. But this guy, because he wasn't going to help the cop, the, and he said, I'll take one for the team, and he mouthed off to the cop. He gave him four months in jail and like I forget, it was like a thousand or two thousand hours of community. Service. Like it was an absurd charge. Like <coughs> they're gonna throw a kid in jail for just mouthing off to a cop when really it was just a it was just a bunch of kids getting in a fight. Like yeah, it, something whatever. stupid. Yeah, it was something stupid when we were kids. So it, I wonder if there's more to this story that's it's, gonna come. There's got to be more to this story that's gonna. Or come. Or I'm wondering if they just wanted him to plea down, so they're like they're stacking charges on there. It's like, hey, we'll remove all of these charges if you just plead guilty to the drone thing, and then we'll just uh, yeah. settle this outside of court, which saves the county a bunch of money, saves every the prosecutor time. So it's like if you stack on charges, hey, you're facing, you know, these five charges, which yeah. then you can say this carries this fine, this carries this fine, this carries this fine. And you can list them all as like you're facing this, you're facing, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines up to 10 years in jail. Because if you stack it all, even though the judge is never going to give him all of that. And it scares then, him. Yeah, it scares you, even though he's like, hey, I may be guilty of the drone. But I'm not guilty of this, this and this and this because it goes against all conventional hunting but it ended up backfiring because this just makes the game wards in pennsylvania and the whole system over there in pennsylvania look ridiculous yeah it it makes them look really bad this is a bad look for game wards yeah because it's like like if you shoot a deer five minutes before shooting light and you go and it becomes dark you aren't allowed to go recover that deer without your you're not allowed to go recover that deer that's according to what the testimony of this game warden. you can be cited yeah, that's that's. And that's then ridiculous. if you take a flashlight with you while you're searching for that deer, and you happen to spook some other deer with your flashlight and see them, you can be cited for two wildlife violations: spotlighting and hunting in and this other, you know, hunting you know at night. Yeah, that's that's insanely ridiculous. Yeah, now, th- is there anything else to this case? Yeah, it's like I'll go on to say what some of the the game war- they tried to like the fish and game department tried to clarify is like our position has always been unified that hunting and recovery are the same. The definition in Title Thirty Two includes tracking and pursuit. Um, tracking a wounded animal would be hunting under the letter of the law. Okay, so hold on. So <laughs> what I just said, I, I didn't expect that because that's yeah. the game. Not only. So if they are stacking charges, I get it. Like that's something that they do, but they look bad in this case. It makes mm-hmm. the game wards, especially in Pennsylvania, look really bad. And what they did is instead of saying, "Hey, let's work something out," they're like, "No, we're going to double down and tell you that if you're hunting." Their official statement that is that if you're hunting at night and shoot something and go out and to recover it with a flashlight, you are hunting at night and you have broken the law. I'd venture to say, ninety-five to a hundred percent of hunters in Pennsylvania oh, yeah. are now poachers. Based oh on yeah. That. 
Yeah, because um, I've recovered deer at night that I've shot. Um, you know, oh, yeah. you know, my crossbows or rifle or shotgun or whatever instrument I've used is in the truck, and I've walked out there, followed the blood trail, grabbed the deer, gutted it, and and I've even seen deer while I'm out there and I'm shining my flashlight on them. I finished off a deer after dark. I, listen, I know that that's maybe, probably that's probably that's definitely legal. Yeah, you, you I know, know it is. Listen, I, I, there's there's two different things here. Like I'll I'll admit to what I did. Yeah. this was when I was uh, much younger. I shot a deer. I, I hit a branch with a bow. I was a teenager at the time. I followed the deer in into the into the woods. I saw the deer laying there and it had its head up. So I shot it. I mean, technically, I broke the law. Like I'll be the first one to admit, and that, that's why I said that's why I thought it was important to say that when we're because ta- we're going to talk about people that are on TV that are poaching and that yeah. they're getting their shows and losing yeah. their livelihood. It's important to put things in perspective. Yeah. You got to follow the laws, but there's there's a difference between following the law and following the spirit of the law. And, and what's and what's also morally correct. Like if that deer is wounded, and he's going to lay there all night. When you have the ability to put him out of his misery yeah. right then and there, it's like, what are you going to do? It's like you're making a moral judgment call, either follow the letter of the law or you're, you know, putting that deer out of his misery, doing the moral, what I believe is the morally correct thing to do. Allegedly, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly, I did that. Uh, but no, look, I'll stand by. I stand by that. And and, and now that was obviously I was much younger at the time and um when you see that deer, you're not gonna let it you're not gonna let an animal suffer yeah you know but if i would have shot it if i'd have shot a deer that wasn't wounded well then yeah i should have been charged i should have oh yeah getting got in trouble i should have all that yeah I'm if you're wa- it, but. yeah if you're walking out there you know with a, just a flashlight spotlighting deer yeah that's definitely beyond the pale and poaching and but if it's a deer that you've already wound you wounded legally you should do everything within your best efforts to recover that deer. There's some times when you should keep your mouth shut and do what's right. <laughs> you know, especially yeah. if you're going to have game wardens like this that like are going to yeah. like. And and to even you know, further on that they were probably stacking on charges like um, when under cross examination is like neither game warden could recall ever citing a hunter for trying to recover a down um, down game at night. Nor could they point to a single section of the state's game code that supported their position. So yeah, that, so they're just making stuff up. <laughs> like, that's no, it's that's like, insane. So it's basically like they can pick one section of the law that says this, but, you know, it's like, okay, this statute says this about recreational spotlight, but nowhere in the else in the uh, in the book that actually do, deals with wildlife code actually says that, you know, recovering game at night is illegal when everybody in the state that's a hunter has probably done that at one point or another you know if they've been hunting for any period of time yeah they're and, all they're all poachers based on that everyone if you're in pennsylvania right now you're a poacher according to the game wardens so be yeah, careful and like not, why would anybody trust a game warden if they're gonna do those sorts of things yeah and it's like and they they've never cited anybody for this besides well these guys at least these guys have it besides this guy which means they're just trying to it's like sounds like they're just trying to screw this guy yeah, so, I don't like it. I don't like a, it. Did, listen, even if the guy did mouth off or did do something or you are back in charges, realize when to, to, to let it go yeah. and realize that you're the one looking bad, not him. Yeah, and um, going back to, um, you know, the spotlighting case, it's like, you know, spotlighting is like carrying an artificial light of any kind while carrying a weapon could constitute spotlighting. Hmm. So, like, if you're walking to your stand with a flashlight... Is are you spotlighting deer? I mean, technically, it's like you. It's like if a, it's like you have an artificial light, you have a gun. It's not shooting hours. Can you be cited for it? it just sounds be, like yes. It sounds like you'd be cited. He's like, oh, I was just walking to your stand. That's that becomes almost your word against the game warden's word, or your. It's like oh, yeah. But even though I know I've walked to my stand with a flashlight, I usually try and use a, le- a red light. You know, because it's, you know, a little bit... Still an artificial light. Still an artificial light. You know, it's used for coyote hunting, um, but it's still an artificial light. But you use an artificial light um, all the time, you know, even exiting the stand while you're carrying it. So, you you know, I've I've had some pretty thick places, you know, and there's a couple creeks that when you cross, you're... uh, Could be kind of rough. Yeah. That uh, a light might be... Um, needed. A safety, a safety issue. Yeah, you know. I mean, and I don't know. This, this, this case. You got something, Corey? 
Yeah, so uh, I noticed it says artificial light. Can you therefore uh, light up your torch? <laughs> <laughs> We're sitting there with an old school lantern. <laughs> the Amish are okay. The, yeah, the Amish. <laughs> the Amish out there with their torches. You got your lantern out there. It's like, hear ye, hear ye, ye rapscallions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could be, a, you know, I think that's a fair point from now on. We'll start taking fires into the woods. Your candle. Yeah. It's, like, it's like I have my uh, my candle. I'm not spotlighting. I have a candle to find my way to the tree stand. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, or maybe they just want your night vision, but I'm sure there's probably another statute that I'm not seeing in this article about using night vision devices yeah, I'm sure while uh, trying to locate your tree stand. So it's like... And it's, this isn't us about bashing game wardens either. It's more of like we need you need clarification on game laws so that you know hunters aren't inadvertently um, breaking the law. And going back to game wardens, the, uh, the laws need to be um, enforced uniformly. I think that's something you know you know we'd wish all law enforcement agencies would do and all judges and everything. It's not, a, of course it's not a perfect world. That doesn't always happen. You know, that's what we would wish for, but, yeah, but still this is, this is an over the top type of thing right here. It's not, I, I don't know. There's going to, there's yeah. something else is I'm telling you, something else is going to come out about this. Yeah. Where once this court case is settled, somebody's going to say something where the yeah. guy got mad. There's, there's something yeah, that we don't know. And right now the game um, look bad. I'm almost thinking that, they're thinking like, wow, this guy was just brazen for having a drone recovery business, just knowing that it was illegal and doing it anyways. Yeah, he should be charged for that. that oh, was, yeah. I'm but, like, but that's the other thing. Well, let's let's talk about that a little bit outside of the court case. Uh, drone recovery. Oh. Um, we I talked to a guy. Um, oh, man, I mean, I can't remember the company's name. Um, they were at their last show we were oh, at. Oh, game with a W. Was yeah, like, they they had their own drone uh, recovery. Give, give me a t-shirt. And when I when I saw it. I sorry guys for forgetting your name, but they they have they have the the infrared lights and stuff like that, and it it does take deer recovery to another level where you there's deer that have traditionally been shot, bad shot happens, a deer moves right when you shoot, uh, something bad yeah, happens, the deer a, gets away, take a branch, yeah, and then next thing you know that deer just goes and rots in the woods, and now it doesn't have to rot anymore. You get the meat, you get you fill your tag. I mean, these people who, yeah. who lose or, a deer in most states, and I know like Alaska is a little different, but most states when you shoot a deer, if you don't recover it, you don't have to use your tag. Yeah. So that's that's something where you're going to have less deer killed and more meat in the freezers by adding this drone recovery. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's not even bad shots. I've had good shots where a deer hasn't opened up for 50, 60 yards, especially during bow season. Especially yeah. during bow season unless you're unless you're a really good tracker, you may not be able to follow that deer if you're a novice hunter. Um following tracks and knowing where a deer is going to go and you know, and we were all novice hunters at one point. Oh yeah, we some all us, were. Some of us were lucky, like me and you. We had um, my our, our grandpa, my dad. You know, like we had we had people that knew how to hunt around us. Our uncle and, Don, like we went into the woods with them. We were taught. But a lot of these people, you know, a lot of people that are hunting, we want to grow the sport of hunting because it's constantly shrinking. I mean, yeah, you want to get it bigger. You have to have people that are able to, you know, recover those deer, and, and they're going to make some mistakes sometimes. Yeah, and. Um, uh, Maverick uh, Drone Service. Was it uh, Maverick? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Corey, the producer, found it. So <laughs> Maverick yeah. Drone Company here in, here in Ohio. Yeah, but it's also, um, you know, like, you know, like everyone starts out a novice, but, you know, you know, you can't, you don't, you miss a deer at 60 yards. It also, like, and I think drones are great. Same thing with dogs. Dogs are great, too. Anything that helps the hunter recover a down deer yeah. is a good thing. And what one thing I do like about drones is the airspace there is no such thing as property lines yeah so that you can fly over top of property lines especially if you're like in an urban like a more urban um environment like uh the one place i hunt um i have six acres um both the neighbors if i shoot a deer are fine with me recovering it on their property but once you get a little bit farther out it starts to become questionable and but if you're just tracking and you get to one of those things, you don't know if it's crossed that, you know, 50 yards to the next property or it's crossed three properties. If you can find that deer, you only have to disturb one neighbor to say, hey, can I recover this deer that's in your backyard instead of knocking on six doors in a row saying, hey, can I cross your property? Hey, and it only takes one to say no. Yeah. And you and then you're then you're done. Yeah. 
where and then you got you just got one and hopefully it's like hey you know you got a dead deer laying in your backyard um i can get it away from you out of there take care of it otherwise it's just gonna sit there and rot and bring coyotes bring in. coyotes in so yeah. hopefully you know that one person's gonna the one person's gonna say yes go ahead get your deer get out of here i don't want to see your face again or whatever yeah and as opposed to you may have six neighbors i'm just you pick that would with, with you have a one in six chance of being told no and losing your deer as opposed to maybe a one chance where the drone can fly above. Um, not having to worry about um, property lines because airspace is free game once you're over. I wonder if that's caused any issues in hunting. Uh, I wonder if the drone thing's caused any issues. I know that people, as soon as drones came out, it was pretty quick that game agencies were like, no. You know, and, yeah. and so... The, the confusing part for me with Pennsylvania, and I'd love to hear from a game warden, any game warden that, that doesn't like what we're saying or disagrees, like, by all means, come talk to us. Tell us what you yeah, think. Yeah, and explain um, ex- explain what's going on there because reading from this article and a couple of other car- articles I've read from, that's it's what's being reported. And so, or even if there's somebody that knows something about this case that, that, that disagrees with what we're saying, I, I love to find the people... Who, if I say something and people are disagreeing with, it, I'd love to have someone on to talk about it, to, to, to or even you know message us. Like I said, we'll respond to all the comments on yeah. the hunting news um, uh, yeah. Facebook page. So I mean, by all means, if there's something, like I said, there's something here we don't know, and it's gonna come out eventually. But it seems that the game wardens kind of uh, jumped the shark with this one and yeah. thought that they were gonna take this guy down. And they, I mean, look, they're probably mad because he was poaching he was using a drone to hunt and you're, you're doing well, here and he wasn't supposed to yeah even if that should be legal which i think me and you both are on the same page there he's not he did break the law and he should be charged with that yeah um and the law should be changed yeah and uh, but i do think you need to make sure all laws are written correctly so that you know drones aren't used for hunting and it's only it's narrow enough that they have a narrow enough scope that they're only used for what they're intended to be used for and that there's not um, like leeway out of it where it can get over the line. Yeah, because some the, the bunch of rednecks will come up with some real clever <laughs> ideas to oh, get yeah. around these laws. Trust oh, me. Yeah. I've got grown up in the culture. I know I know <laughs> I've, I've seen oh, yeah. some things. <laughs> oh yeah. So it's like so you know, I understand them say, hey, make this illegal now. We'll ease into it, and this guy is probably like, no, you're going to do it now. You know, we did have a family member, um, I won't say their name even though they're gone now, but that used turned a gun and was shooting arrows out of a gun. Um, I was told this story <laughs> by, 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 uh, by, um, by Uncle Don. It wasn't, don't you know what, it, it might have been him because he was like, listen, let me tell you what one of our family members did. <laughs> It might have been him looking back on it, but um, no, somebody who they were, they turned a gun into a bow. This is pre crossbow and stuff like that. So, so this would probably like in the, what, the fifties. I have no clue. I just remember uncle Don telling me about it. No one them is probably in the fifties or sixties. Yeah. Up in the mountains of West Virginia. Yeah. There's a lot but of crazy. That was, that, I mean, yeah, they've, but that was also a different time period. You know, it was, it was a lot different than it is now. Hunting's way more regulated. There's a lot more attention paid to it. Um, there's a lot more eyeballs in the woods. There's cameras everywhere. Literally. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> literally. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an interesting court case. I think that that's something that as it, when we get any updates, we're going to talk, we'll talk about, we'll make it a smaller segment on another podcast. Yeah. If, yeah. That's, I'll try and keep an eye on it. Sometimes court cases like this, because hunting is like a small niche industry. It's kind of like, we've noticed it's kind of hard to follow up sometimes because like uh, a lot of the big, a lot of the news doesn't get out from like this from all the states yeah, first absolutely. but it's but we'll do our best to keep following us because i find this one very interesting and i think definitely um laws need to be clarified to you know the, the best ability possible so that we are doing the right thing whenever we can yeah i agree all right well thanks for tuning into this episode like i said this is the first one for youtube so if you like it subscribe uh also follow us on social media especially facebook that's where we engage with people for the most part um and we will be doing a podcast at least one a week probably come deer season probably maybe even do two a week uh because there's so much to talk about at those times it's not just going to be court cases and stuff like that it's also going to be um uh, it's going to be a wide variety of things yeah. really literal to smorgasbord yeah <laughs> like we have uh, one coming up of uh, there's so, a guy who is breeding breeding uh sheep with uh t- give, give a little teaser for that oh, for maybe our yeah. next episode a guy was caught smuggling 
and cloning sheep to sell to like uh, Marco Polo sheep from China and then cloning them and breeding them with other bighorn sheep to sell them to high fence game ranches as a new breed of sheep. That is, I mean, it's like he was selling them for a ton of money. But so it's like Jurassic Park type weird stuff. <laughs> Jurassic Park for hunters. I mean, for sheep hunters. But sheep hunters will pay a lot of money to get a sheep. I, I would. Um, but anyways, yes, we'll, we'll do talk about that in the next couple of episodes. Uh, thanks for watching, and we will talk to you guys next time.